Thank you. And to all our listeners and viewers, again, my name is Mark Critchie. I'm very honored to be serving as president of Global Minnesota. We're glad that you're with us today on this uh, very uh, special opportunity, this special interview with my friend Rob Perlberg, who's one of the nation and the world's leading political scientists who's been following and analyzing and explaining and sharing insights on food and agriculture and all of the related aspects of that part of life for a, quite a long time. But most importantly, he's been sharing it in a way that many people have been touched and impacted and influenced. And a brand new book is out. And I asked if he would join us today. And I'm so thrilled to have you on. Professor Paul Berg, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you. My pleasure. It's great to be here. So yeah, you shouldn't forget to mention the title of the book, which is uh, Resetting the Table, Straight Talk it, About the Food We Grow and Eat. Very, very clever title. And it's right there on Amazon with a bunch of your other books. Bless them. But what the uh, part about it that's most interesting is how you have woven together political science with something that some people might take as a very narrow frame food as a kind of cultural thing, or food as a business matter, or food as maybe a lifestyle or something. But I've been uh, very taken by that aspect of this book and your other work, because this was the 100th anniversary of the time period when uh, Minnesotans, our farmers, our grain millers, were called upon to feed first Belgium and France, parts of France, because they were being starved by the British blockade and the Germans taking their food. The politics of war being blended with the politics of creating hunger created a very huge impact on the US, on the US farm policies, on the US transportation. The interplay of politics, whether that's old fashioned or civil war, conflicts, whatever, has now global ramifications, and you've been out in the forefront of trying to describe those global ramifications for decades. I wonder if you could start with giving us some insights about how you see that interconnection of your political science part and this thing we call food and this incredible uh, activity of humanity we call agriculture. Well, it's very important, and it's sometimes missed by the agricultural economists who tend to uh, dominate public policy in this uh, space. Uh, it's national governments, really, that uh, shape the policy environment in which uh, farmers produce and in which uh, consumers uh, eat. And it's a fascinating uh, pattern overall in advanced industrial countries, the United States, Western Europe, uh, Japan, uh, farmers are few in number relative to non-farmers, but they're very well organized and they've been quite effective in securing benefits from their governments. Those benefits sometimes take the form of publicly funded research, sometimes direct cash transfers, sometimes protectionist measures at the border. And uh, farmers in, in rich countries are pretty well treated by their governments compared to farmers in poor countries which uh, are often politically weak. There are many of them, but they're not organized. Many of them are illiterate. They're in remote areas in the countryside. Many are women. They don't have a strong political voice. So governments tend to serve urban constituencies, urban consumers that would be um, industrialists, uh, students, bureaucrats, the army, the police. What those people want is cheap food. And the governments give them cheap food in part by not paying enough money to, uh, to farmers for the food that's grown. The result, of course, is frequently um, a food shortage, which may have to be made up uh, through uh, exports from those rich countries that are promoting agriculture and sometimes generating too much food. So when politics turns into war, and we have some big ones, you know, the First World War, the Second World War come to mind, uh, we've had very large hunger as a weapon campaigns. And sometimes it's the British trying to starve the Germans and the Belgium and the French getting stuck in the middle. And sometimes it's the Germans trying to starve the Russians and the Ukrainians. But I mean, these were kind of organized campaigns to make food as a weapon. But in the case of the First World War, um, 
the Belgium government reached out to a young American, Herbert Hoover, said, hey, can you raise enough money and get enough ships and get those farmers in Minnesota to turn over their grain to you and ship it to us and save us from starving? And so when politics turns into conflict zones, internal, being civil, wars, big wars, little wars, whatever wars that be, then there's a ricochet. There's a ricochet. And so in that instance, which you know Minnesota was a really big part of, and, and it changed our whole scene, our milling scene, our farming scene, those ricochets then seem like have concentric circles of impact over decades. You've written about some of those multiple you know, we sometimes call it the butterfly effect or whatever, but things can cause dislocation and disruption in many places over many long periods of time. Political science seems to have grappled with that more than let's say agricultural economics. You wanna give us a sense of how political scientists think about those interconnectedness of these kinds of massive political events like wars. Well, in, in the case of um, U.S. famine relief in the Soviet Union, uh, you're right, uh, uh, Herbert Hoover organized the American Relief Association. And in the 1920s, after, after the Bolshevik Revolution, the United States fed 10 million uh, people who were uh, threatened by starvation. Many people did starve, but uh, American grain uh, from Minnesota and elsewhere saved the lives of 10 million people in, in Russia. And it was long remembered uh, by uh, people uh, in the opposition to, to the Bolshevik party. The Bolsheviks didn't block this effort, but they weren't sympathetic at all uh, to the effort. They knew that Hoover was not sympathetic with their ideology. It's a fascinating story, but it actually created uh, a, a bridge of mutual respect that helped in the Second World War when the United States uh, joined uh, with, uh, with the Russians to defeat Nazi Germany. So that's a very important way that something that had come out of a hunger, a famine situation, then created what you called a bridge uh, when there was a, a threat, a threat of the scale of, uh, of Hitler. And I, I would note that Herbert Hoover was <clears throat> honored along with his partner from Minnesota, uh, James Ford Bell, uh, by the King of Belgium and the, the government of France for saving 10 million lives in France and Belgium in 1915 mm -hmm. and 1916, 1917. So Herbert Hoover had a decade of saving lives in Europe um, that, that you are pointing out how important that was trying to meld those two army or, or, or military uh, forces uh, facing a very fierce, uh, very powerful uh, Nazi army, Nazi right. military. Yeah, it, it unfortunately doesn't always uh, work <laughs> as well. Uh, this was not wartime, but in the 1960s, mm -hmm. uh, there was a serious drought in India. The monsoon failed two years in a row and uh, Indians uh, uh, faced uh, a risk of famine. Uh, they flooded into the cities to beg for food in the streets. Uh, it, was, it was nearly a catastrophe, but uh, President Lyndon Johnson at the time uh, decided to mobilize US agricultural resources and uh, through an agreement with the government of India, uh, the U.S. began sending two shiploads of U.S. wheat every day uh, to, uh, to India, and, and that uh, it prevented a famine. So that's a fabulous story in understanding just how big of a problem it was and what it took. Absolutely. I mean, imagining Absolutely. the infrastructure to be able to feed a continent, or in this case, a very large country. Yeah, but, but here's, here's the catch. Lyndon Johnson being Lyndon Johnson, and this being in the middle of the Vietnam War, and because the government of India was not sympathetic with US war policies in Vietnam, Lyndon Johnson decided to take advantage of what he thought was the leverage he now enjoyed uh -huh. over the government of India to ask them to cease their criticism 
of U.S. war policies. Well, the government of India didn't take to that. So this is the political science part of this story. Yes. Now, uh, uh, what happened? Johnson literally humiliated the Indian ambassador. He would call him down to the LBJ ranch in Texas in order to make the announcement that the next uh, tranche of food aid was on its way to India. He didn't tell the ambassador in advance whether it was going to be approved or not. He'd have him out there on the lawn in front of the cameras and then generously uh, approve uh, the next uh, tranche. He did it at the last minute. This was called a short tether policy. <laughs> the purpose was to put maximum pressure on the government of India. Well, uh, the government of India didn't cool its criticism of the United States uh, very much. But what it learned from this uh, was uh, the importance of not depending upon uh, a geopolitical uh, adversary Mm. For uh, for your your basic food supplies, and it was really at this point that the government of India began making serious investments in its own agricultural sector. India had been like the country I described before, dominated by urban industrial interests. It had not invested much in agricultural uh, improvements, but after this experience with Lyndon Johnson, they went full speed ahead with investments in in agriculture, fertilizers, irrigation, and uh, within five or six years, they were no longer dependent upon imports of wheat or rice. And uh, it was, uh, it, in a way, the United States did uh, India and India's farmers a favor uh, by so blatantly humiliating uh, India's politicians. Well, it sounds like they uh, made the planet, generally speaking, more self-reliant, food being a basic, by making sure that you know productivity, the the kinds of things that add to productivity and infrastructure, like you mentioned, irrigation, investing in those things makes India more food secure, but also then as a result might make the planet. I wonder what you think of the current situation now in India, where there's such massive protests and seemingly going on for months, farmers coming to the cities. Uh, it's COVID somewhere, but is there a ricochet? Is there a, a secondary or tertiary impact that now is coming out again in what we might think of as a political science kind of side to these things? Yeah, well, this, this is an interesting, uh, but uh, a very complicated uh, uh, event. The farmers that are coming to, uh, to Delhi are mostly um, Sikhs from uh, Punjab and uh, Haryana. And these are actually the most prosperous farmers in India. These are farmers that received all of those investments back in, in the 1960s and the 1970s and the 1980s. And uh, they uh, were, were given a very generous price guarantees uh, by the government. The government promised to purchase uh, wheat at, uh, at an inflated price. Uh, the government uh, promised them uh, subsidies for irrigation and for fertilizers. The government is now saying, well, maybe uh, we should give a little more room for the private sector to make these investments and, and not spend as much public money procuring wheat from, uh, from these Punjabi farmers. Of course, oh, so the government has proposed a, a liberalization strategy and it's angering, of course, it's angering uh, the farmers that have been on the receiving end of government guarantees for all these years. Uh, but uh, these are not the poorest of India's farmers. These are actually the richest of India's farmers that are, that are taking to the streets. Of course, it often happens that way. Uh, effective political organization, organization usually is built upon uh, a certain amount of uh, financial resources, uh, sophisticated political organization. This is not something that poor farmers in India are yet capable of. It seemed interesting that the government at the time of that kind of reaction to understanding <clears throat> the dangers of dependence on large food imports chose to put a privilege and a, and a, and a special emphasis on a, a, a minority, a, a, a minority. I mean, it's also interesting that the Gandhi movement, the independence movement was so dramatically from farmers also, from peasant farmers in particular. So there's a, there's a clear understanding that in 
a modern democracy in India being the world's largest democracy as um, the billboards are saying, um, uh, the, the shifting around of assets, the shifting around of investment to a minority like the Sikh, you know, who are not are you know, privileged in, in a kind of a majority population way, or Gandhi building a movement on a mass movement. Um, do you see that kind of generally that those political considerations are important when you have, like, let's say, an institution like the Electoral College, which is a very unusual uh, institution, um, so that some little tiny regions numerically can have a very, very outsized impact politically? And so if you imagine what your political strategy might be, you might concentrate on small population, big political impact opportunities when you're considering who to try to suppress and who to try to inflate. Did politics always in the middle of these things? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, you mentioned the Electoral College. It's fascinating uh, because um, State of California gets two senators, and uh, well, this isn't the Electoral College now. This is uh, uh, this is the the composition of the United States Senate, uh, where that's how we make our Electoral College numbers up. Yeah, yeah, course, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the senators are some of the Electoral College numbers, yeah. but uh, California gets two, and South Dakota gets two. Uh, is that fair? <laughs> Not to Californians. But it gives um, it gives uh, outsized influence to a thinly populated, uh, quite often natural resource or agricultural states. So, so they are usually very well treated inside the United States Senate, uh, and also because um, because uh, redistricting uh, lags behind population movements, uh, rural districts tend to be overrepresented uh, everywhere in, in, in the US political system. It's, uh, you're, you're more likely to be forgotten uh, if you're living in suburban Boston uh, than if you're in a, a, a thinly populated uh, congressional district in, in Western- so This Texas. affects the, the state level legislature and the federal, I yes. can hear. And, um, you know, electoral strategy is sometimes a strategy of rewarding some and sometimes a strategy of pushing some out or trying to keep them yeah. from voting yeah. or discouraging them in some, in some way or another. So food has had different kinds of interplays with politics. What about going into the future when we're having technological revolution in food production, some of it spectacular, some of it fantastic. Um, but uh, the, the, the internationalization of those technological advances seems to be changing, at least maybe the physical origins of some of the food products, you know, you know, diets change, uh, uh, plant based protein is on a big run right now, etc. How do you see the future politics intersecting with food and agriculture? Uh, well, it's, we, we say, you know, the world food system, but uh, local differences are, are, are extreme, particularly when it comes to, to food production. I mean, farmers in, in Minnesota can afford uh, all of uh, the benefits of um, GPS auto steered tractors and uh, uh, smart equipment uh, that uses digital soil mapping to put down uh, inputs at a variable rate to optimize the growth of the crop. Uh, uh, UAVs, drones with uh, sensors that can spot uh, pest pressures before, uh, before they get out of control. Uh, it's with, with drip irrigation, lasers to level the fields, um, big data. <laughs> it's, it's a big it's, list. It's one thing after another <laughs> that uh, that commercial farmers in the United States can afford, and farmers in developing countries 
can't afford any of those things. So the, uh, of course, the benefits of these new technologies are considerable. Uh, if you look at commercial agriculture in the United States, since 1980, uh, production has increased by almost 50%, but fertilizer use is, has, has not increased at all. We're learning to use uh, chemicals with so much more precision that uh, it's environmentally friendly. It, we, with insecticides, insecticide use in the United States actually peaked in 1972. Uh, now we have more precise applications. We have crops that have been engineered to protect themselves against insect damage that don't need uh, insecticides. If you look at, at water, uh, water use in American agriculture per bushel of production is way down from, from two decades ago. And land use, of course. If you look at corn production in the United States, Minnesota is a big corn state. Uh, corn production in the United States has increased fivefold since 1940, but land planted to the corn to corn has actually decreased by by 20 percent. So, uh, if you if you use modern science in farming, and rich countries can afford to do that, you end up not only being more productive, you end up uh, saving natural resources from the continuous expansion of low yield farming. In developing countries, they're, they're not really able to do that yet. And so uh, low yield farming in Africa continues to expand into forests. Uh, it goes um, up the watershed, sloping hillsides, dry, dry lands, and environmental damage is, is considerable. I would like to see more science-based farming introduced into developing countries. We need applications of science that smallholder farmers can afford. And there are some out there we need to spend more time on that. So I, th I think about the 10,000 years ago or whatever, when some farmers in a volcanic valley in Mexico, or what we call Mexico today, figured out over several generations how to create this thing we call corn, and then how it slowly found its way north and south, but it moved all the way up to Minnesota and made us wealthy. And so that's a long arc for a kind of basic crop. But when we think about, let's say the next, not 10,000 years, but Time Magazine thinks the baby born a couple years ago lived to be 150. So let's go out 150 years. So let's go to, you know, 2021, 2020, you know, 2150. The, changes in climate, the changes in some of the other dynamics of our ecosystem with, let's say, population levels at whatever number we can imagine. But we also see that the demographics of the age population will change. Africa will have, you know, half of the top 10 population-based countries. And, you know, we'll have a, a new world when our kids and grandkids are uh, in charge. Is there one thing you uh, came away with and, you know, setting the table, I'm assuming leads you to talking and thinking and writing that next version that, hey, the table of the future will look like this and that will make the world more resilient more sustainable. What's one of those conclusions or one of those aspirations or one of those visions and dreams that you come out when you apply your pragmatic political science side to this, this thing that has so many sides to it, culture and everything else. Um, it's sometimes hard to uh, think about wh what that really positive vision looks like. Yeah, well, uh, of course, uh, the wild card is is climate change, and I'm not that optimistic hmm. about um, advanced industrial countries, together with uh, China, Brazil, and India, reducing their greenhouse gas emissions uh, fast enough to protect us from a, a, a two degree increase in in temperature, with all of the climate destabilization that that will 
that that will bring. The only way to stay ahead of that, if you're interested in sustainable food production, is much larger investments in new agricultural science to develop crops and cropping systems that are um, drought resistant, that uh, can uh, survive under uh, higher temperatures. Um, that's, that's being done, but is not being uh, adequately invested in. The, the consumption side, though, uh, also has to be has to be taken into account. Uh, uh, one of the one of the seismic changes that we're seeing and we're going to continue to see is a growth in income, uh, middle class income, in densely populated uh, Asia, including not just China and Southeast Asia, but uh, um, India as well. And when this happens, uh, less in India, but in the other places, people will choose to consume more meat, milk, and eggs, more animal products. Uh, so now you have to not just feed a larger population, you have to feed a rapidly growing population of animals to provide uh, the meat, milk, and eggs to uh, the increasingly affluent urban populations. And so there's gonna be an explosion in demand for animal products. And we don't know yet if there's a, a way to to uh, produce that much meat, milk, and eggs in an environmentally sustainable way. Uh, there may not be. And so one hope I have, uh, the, and, and this is still just a hope, but one hope I have is that we will continue to improve uh, plant-based imitation meat mm -hmm. products, plant-based imitation milk, plant-based imitation eggs. We already have plant-based imitation milk. Uh, coconut milk and uh, almond milk and rice milk have already taken over 13% of the fluid milk market. Uh, I don't know if your friends at Land O'Lakes are happy with that, but uh, it's, uh, it's something that, uh, uh, that I favor. Uh, with meat, of course, we have plant-based imitation meats, uh, Beyond Burgers, Impossible Burgers, and demand has been growing quite rapidly uh, over the last two or three years. Impossible Meats increased its production sixfold uh, over the last year. And they've, uh, they've actually cut their prices twice over the last year, which is an indication that uh, you'd think with demand surging, they'd raise their price, but no, 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 they cut their price. They don't wanna be a niche product. They want to replace uh, beef uh, they, from animals. And if, if they're successful, uh, and if then, if cell-based, uh, meat products uh, come along and they're farther away from reaching a competitive uh, price point, but they'll taste like real beef because they'll be real beef. There won't be any living animals. They'll be grown in Petri dishes, but this will be real beef. And then we're going to have cell-based fish, uh, imitation, it's not imitation fish, it's, it, it's real fish, but uh, not swimming around in the ocean. Once again, it's grown uh, in, in petri dishes. If we can advance this uh, revolution in plant-based and in cell-based uh, animal product substitutes, I think there's a, a good chance that we'll, a, we'll, we'll get through the, um, uh, the pressure that demand for animal protein is going to apply. And it would be an enormous benefit to the environment, of course. The, the plant-based uh, burgers uh, use um, far less water, far less land, and they emit 90% fewer greenhouse gas emissions than uh, hamburgers from, uh, from, from real animals. And if you're not growing animals, uh, you're not tempted to abuse, uh, to abuse the use of antibiotics. And so you're, you're, you're not putting uh, uh, antibiotics for human medical use at the same risk that, that they might be today if we continue using uh, antibiotics in livestock production. So uh, that's a uh, great vision. I mean, you, well, that's, you you've thought about this a lot. Well, I I don't think it's impossible. I mean, uh, no, we, you just described the the, the fashion industry uh, came up with imitation fur. Yeah, uh, yeah. the yeah. shoe industry came up with imitation leather. Uh, it's a scientific challenge, but a lot of big money is going into it right now. And right, and these products and, will just keep getting better. And my hope is they will uh, diminish our currently unsustainable uh, reliance on, um, on living animals uh, to meet uh, this, this growing demand. Well, what, what I know 
being the son of a scientist and having trained to be a scientist is that scientists love challenges. And so alongside of political science, I can see that you posit this vision because you also appreciate the challenge, human beings stepping up to a challenge. And I, um, you know, I mentioned earlier the defeating of Belgium and, and, and Northern um, France. And one of the ways that we understand that is that there's a giant exhibit of these letters written by the school kids of Liège, Belgium in 1915 to the children of America, thanking them for saving their lives by the food that came and saved their lives. Mm. But back here in the United States, there was a giant program to promote meatless Mondays and use corn instead of wheat and think about those children of Belgium, young children of America, don't leave food on your plate. Uh, it was the same time as the Armenians. And so we have seen in the past, the, the you know, when we've had to meet a crisis or an emergency that we, you know, think about all the pieces and put it all together and say, okay, we've got to produce more wheat and get it over to Belgium and France. We've got to eat less wheat here. We've got to take that meatless Monday as an opportunity and make it, uh, you know, part of what we do. And I feel like you've given us that kind of a comprehensive way to think positively about the future. And that's the thing that helps people go, oh, I got to get up tomorrow morning and be part of the solution. I got to get up tomorrow morning because we have a place to go. And I know in a pandemic, which I've never lived through one, but now I've got some appreciation of a hundred years ago, but uh, your vision gives a way to think about what the pieces of that solution could look like. And that was really, that's such a contribution that you've made your whole life, your whole career. And it's one of the reasons I wanna, you know, urge you to think about writing that next book. You know, <laughs> you know we, this is political science, if nothing else, has a, a rhythm and a pattern to be able to analyze and you've been able to merge these two fundamental human activities. We do politics, that's human beings. Sometimes we like it, sometimes we don't. We eat and produce food and talk about food. And if we cannot access food or if we access food in a way that destroys the ecosystem or destroys our body, um, we create famine and difficulty for ourselves and for future generations. So I kind of feel like you've been helping to protect future generations um, by putting in front. Let's think about these as one thing. It's, it's oh, a, uh, well, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that, Mark. Uh, I mean, you've, you've done politics, but I'm interested now in the huge contribution you're making as a, a convener, uh, as someone who inspires and organizes cooperation among different groups, someone who can get these new innovations, these new initiatives moving. It does not happen by itself. It almost never happens with one person deciding to do it. No. It's a cooperative activity and, uh, and you're, you're playing an important role in, uh, in Minnesota. So for me, it's a, it's a privilege to be on the program with you. Thank you so much. And uh, I want to keep up this conversation. And also, uh, there are lots of things unfolding in our own national politics that are kind of interesting. So we have to pick these up again. But every day, there's some new great material for the political scientists. And apparently today, we all got a lot of moisture if I have read the weather reports correctly for your part of the country. So uh, we'll look forward to connecting again. And also thinking about this future. I feel people's hearts and minds opening. There is more light each day right now. And people are trying to think about the future and um, your ability to help move that is such a gift. So thank you so much for being with us today. Rob Parlberg, your new book, Resetting the Table, available in bookstores and all those other places where you get them. And uh, a big uh, bunch of your fan club will keep bugging you to be thinking about that next book as well. Thank you so much, Rob. Thanks a lot, Mark. Bye now.